Hello, and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today, I'm here with Tony Benedict, and he is the CEO advisor. We're going to talk about buying and selling companies and mergers acquisitions, and also we're going to talk about integration, what it looks like after you purchase the company. Thank you for being on the show, Tony. Thanks for having me, Ron. Glad to be here. Do you mind giving us a little bit of the background of how you ended up in the mergers and acquisitions world, and how do you ended up on a podcast about buying, selling, and growing companies? Sure. I'll probably go back a little further than I need to, but I was working. I changed careers after graduate school and left the pharmaceutical industry and went into high-tech manufacturing. And I guess I could say I worked for Intel, um, probably important to know. And they're a global company. They have probably half of what they do on the assembly test side is outsourced. Most of the foundry work is in source. It's their own fabs, but most of the assembly test outside of the microprocessors outsource. So you kind of learn a lot about in source, outsource manufacturing, working for a bunch of other cultures, what it takes to, let's just say, digitize processes. It's beyond just automation. It's using technologies to really make processes more efficient once they've been standardized. And Intel is one of those companies that they coined the term copy exactly, which is you could go into any factory anywhere on the planet. They have all the same machines and they do all the processes exactly the same. So it's not like you have to learn what they do at a factory in Malaysia compared to a factory in Costa Rica. It's all the same. So that standardization is actually a good thing. And obviously a lot of companies struggle doing that. They haven't, especially in the acquisition side. Is there a cost benefit to doing it quicker or what's the real win? Yeah. Working for private equity, the mindset there is get it done. So when you move to, let's say the non-private equity space, there's nothing wrong with the same get it done attitude, right? I think just from my own experience, and I don't want to generalize this too much, that there's a lot of fear. So if you're acquiring another company, the company you're acquiring, all those people, the first thing that goes through their mind is I'm going to lose my job. Okay. And there's two ways to sort of deal with that. If you're the person that says, I'm going to lose my job. I remember when I worked for the private equity and we got acquired by a, a public company, we went public and we got qu acquired by a bigger public company. One of my employees came up to me and said, I hate to do this to you. I love working for you, but I got another job. I feel like this is going to be the Hunger Games in about six months. What a comment. That's fear. That's total fear. You have to assuage people's fears. I think there's a certain amount of fear in the target company. You want to prevent attrition. I think the messaging and communication that never really goes out is that people are more valued than everything else. If you're doing a private equity portfolio company, it tends to be more focused on the transactional financial side of save money. The, the culture you're trying to integrate, how do you work out the fact that there's subcultures and there's variations and all that together may not, if you're an Intel and you've got it down ironclad, how do you work with somebody that's kind of got a, a mixed handbag of random stuff? I will say that what you bring up is very, very common. If you're a large multinational, you have hundreds of cultures and across divisions and departments within divisions. The bigger you are, the more complex the culture is T totally. The smaller companies, obviously, they're a little easier to work with. That being said, though, the most important part of addressing culture is what are the goals and objectives of the company? So if you're trying to let, hypothetically grow revenue 20%, and you've targeted certain product lines and you're acquiring another company that's giving you another product line, how are you measuring growth, profitability, et cetera, et cetera, and keep people focused on that? The last thing you should be worrying about is whether people wear sandals to work. Are they getting the stuff done? And it really comes down to operations, operational integration, 
Are you getting the things done you need to get done to hit your goals and objectives because you're measuring that? And I think that gets lost a lot, unfortunately, for whatever reason, Ron, you could build your own list of reasons why it gets lost, but it does get lost. Small company cultures versus big company cultures and leadership and the differences in leadership. When you're in a small company, it's almost like a family environment. Right. Yeah. Out every Friday, you're doing keggers or pizza or whatever. And people get along and you work hard, but you play hard. And then you get to be a little bit of a bigger company. You start adding more locations and each location will have their own culture based on the leader that runs the location. But at some point, if you have multiple locations, you'll have offsite events where leadership will come in. And you'll try to, we used to call them group hugs at Intel, but in essence, you want to harmonize at least the leadership and management cultures to make sure that everybody's kind of marching in the same direction. So you go from family to say tribe, and then as you get much, much bigger, it becomes like, um, not a great example, but you'll understand when I say it, you look at a guy like Genghis Khan, the way he led these disparate groups of tribes, made him very effective. Companies sort of mirror their own evolution, depending on how good the leadership is and how much you focus on culture. And if you look at Jack Welch and both of his books, which I've read, he said the entire responsibility of any executive is resource management. There's a lot of hidden agendas and who's running what agenda. And really that ties back to leadership and communication. There should only be one agenda and it should be the same agenda everybody works to and communicates to their employees about. And it should be your interpretation of the agenda. This is the agenda. This is what we need to accomplish. Now we're going to assign roles and responsibilities to get it accomplished. And everybody's going to have a role and responsibility because we have a lot to get done. A lot of people, this is probably human nature and the nature of ego is you get a lot of middle managers or senior managers that are trying to toot their own horn during an acquisition and kind of push a little bit of their own agenda, especially if there isn't if one agenda has not been communicated, they're going to take advantage of that and kind of push their agenda for their area so they can shine. To me, it's back to senior leadership. And are they on the same page? Are they pushing one agenda? And is it being communicated on a regular basis? And I mean weekly. The number one thing that can be said immediately upon announcing that you're going to be acquired is that to assuage people's fear of losing their job, there's going to be new jobs. There's going to be the same jobs we have now, but we're going to also add a bunch of new jobs. We need to know who's willing to learn new skills and take on new responsibility in a new job and start tracking people who really want to, let's say, develop and evolve into a different job. And so that's more proactive and that's very effective when you do it early, early on, because people will go, oh, wow, well, I'm ready for a change. 